I would just like to talk about how to, how to integrate these water issues in our cities, how to give hope for next generations. And I'm very humbling to say that, you know, what I show you is just a start. And probably a lot more has to be done with you, with the next generation, and with your students I see in front of me. So let's maybe just start a little bit. I'm very fascinated really to learn just from water itself. Not to think about big theories, but really to look and focus on water. What is water telling us? The beauty, the richness, the forms, the shapes, the silence, and the loud voices what water has. The beauty, how, how water really brings function and aesthetics together. Slowliness, holding back, using time and space and process, something we forgot in our cities. So I think it's so important to think about first, you know, what is it we like to achieve? And it's much more than just climate change or such things. It's really to think about what is a natural cycle. You know, how much water evaporates, how much goes down, how much refills the groundwater aquifer. How is it already changing? And if we look at, at our agriculture uh, places, how is our cities? All the water runs off. And we heard this from the speaker before. We have seen that. So this is a really big challenge that we say, you know, all these points are really doing something. So climate change as a factor re even makes it stronger. Our areas of catchments are sealed. We heard this before so that the water quickly goes down and we have either too much or too little water. And we are all aware about this problem around the world. Many cities are confronted with this extremely strong. It's very often the first decisions when we create our urban structures, our infrastructures. They are often done very unconscious. You know, we say, well, we want to get quick from A to B. We want to get rid of water here. We want to bring traffic connections here. And then our cities start to follow and to come up with this. So what we often look in architecture and ur urban planning, we only look at the top, what we see, but we forget about that, what is actually underneath, to make already, to prepare to make a sustainable cities. And this is really what is below. That is intelligence, how we create our, our uh, infrastructure, how we manage resources, how we are more careful with the protection of it, and how can it be adapted to the culture, to the local people, because this has to be very, very strong, connected to how people handle it, how people live with it, they are the ones who actually have to deal with this. High tech is good, but not everywhere. In some places, it might be totally different. What are our cities and infrastructures look like? We have come up with the status quo, which is often that our systems have no capacity anymore. They just can't handle it. The plug, even if we open it up, underneath everything is full. So we have to think about city and urban planning more as a, something where we start to do our homework right in front of our doorstep and not thinking about someone else, somewhere a technology will solve it. It's actually everywhere around. And I just take this uh, example of what we heard before, Singapore as one case, and I will show others also very quickly. In Singapore, we actually on this island try to think about how can we get to a different approach. Before, of course, with our traditional engineering, we want to get rid of every drop of water with a lot of reasons, because Singapore had a lot of, sl of sludge uh, dr uh, flooding problems, hygienic problems, so a lot to think about it. But we are more thinking of something uh, with the city to come up with a, a strategic plan, which we call ABC Water Guidelines, together with the uh, ABC and the, uh, the, the city of Singapore with their different bureaus like um, uh, POB and others, to come up with a more approach to collect the water, to keep it. So we heard this, uh, like one fjord is actually closed, so it's getting from salt water to, flesh wa uh, to fresh water. We re-pump, we pump the water back, we filter it, and to do so, and we bring it up to the reservoirs from there, we can actually store it and hold it back. So actually, the entire city is actually the catchment, the catchment for water. Think about traditionally, every city is trying to get the water from somewhere, bring it to the city, and give it polluted out. Here we have just a very limited situation because it's an island, so we have to think about it. And I just show you one example uh, of um, uh, one on one topic where we have a park we, where we collect all the water from the different sites and where we actually daylight every stream 
and find better ways to bring bioengineering into the play and uh, get rid of this straight concrete canal. Actually, what we do in this area, we go from these canals, change it completely, reopen it, bring the blue and the green together and say, well, this is not just one, in one part and the other part. We overlap and we bring multifunctional use in spaces. So suddenly you can see this is part of the open space of the park, but it's also part of the canal system. So it's both, it can have both functions. Well, to do this, there's a lot of engineering needed because you cannot do this just uh, somewhere and then let the water go through. Often you have to work under extreme conditions. In these tropical rain uh, uh, areas, you know, where you have suddenly, even on the construction side, situations where suddenly this can be completely flooded. You have to manage that. But it is possible to do this also with new technologies, with soft engineering, with, uh, with a special uh, way of using plants and root systems to stabilize and to avoid erosion. By that also, you have much better water quality. And the interesting uh, point is that you can recycle, for example, the old canal concrete, make something out of it. We made art installations with it. We made artificial hills. This park is packed full with people. And we like to get connected, connections, so that people get close to it, get back to the water. They see this very far often as distance because what people know in a city like Singapore or others is either it's ugly or dirty or stinky or I only know the water from bottles or I know it only from the water type to the sink, 30, 40 centimeters. Most people have no awareness of that this is actually the source of life, that you find lots of biodiversity coming back. In some of these installations where we try to reopen the canals and integrate them and bring more biodiversity, we have 40% more biodiversity coming back, even rare species right coming back into the city. So there are lots of side effects we can take into account. We can really create our cities and our, with some spaces, but we have to make clear decisions. Where do we give space? Where do we give time? And this is something which is a big, big challenge in many, many cities. If you do that uh, and you come into this, you can make the right decisions and can integrate it. But you see, it has to be on the surface, it has to live with the people's need, and you have to come up with a very modern approach. I take some more examples to go in other fields, in some more denser areas. This is the city of Portland, uh, Oregon in the US. Portland uh, is a, again, another city which uh, is taking very much care now for the water. How can we harvest stormwater, rainwater? How can we hold it back? How can we reduce the water consumption from somewhere to bring to the city? And I show you one example, the Tennis Springs Park, where my team did work on this project and we did uh, try to get all the water from the different buildings around, from uh, car parking lots, treat it, bring it slowly down into the park and have actually a, a park situation where the water level can go up and down. So some parts can even be flooded and the water can, can go down. So we give space and time back to the water even in a modern city. Well, the park is also a modern park. Uh, people hang around, they give art performance, they have a lunch picnic or whatever. They can all do this, so it has to be integrated. A third example, maybe quickly, is to go in a dense situation now in a German town. This is Berlin, Potsdamer Platz, where about 50% uh, of the rooftops have green roofs. So we start to filter the water already. We bring it in big cisterns, we recycle the water for toilet flushing and other things. Uh, and we bring it into an open lagoon system where the water level can go up and down. So when we have a lot of rain, there's a buffer and we bring the water more slowly out into the open stream. So the green roofs, the integration of it. And most people don't think that this is not just an aesthetic thing. It is really a function to hold the water back, to keep it and to re recycle and also to filter it. We use, of course, plants and special soil conditions to filter the water so that we have finally uh, clean water. What I think is so important that we have to rethink our systems in a way that we reconnect really the people to it, that they can also be attractive, that they function as something for 
a next generation of design uh, for the city where people can interact with this infra infrastructure, where technology is not just something for experts hidden somewhere underground, but something which is part of the city, part of the daily life. Uh, I think there are lots of more examples we can show uh, to go to really where we have the strong need, like in China, Jianjin, the new city center, where we collect the water from all the different buildings around and also treat it from, from uh, parkways and from plazas. We bring the water into the center and we just opened this project this spring. So this is now a place really packed full with people in the evening. Remember, this water here is not a water from far away, it's water from there. It's water which is stored, which is collected, which is recycled, and we can reuse this water. I know there are big challenges for the future, but it can be done. And we can also go to areas here in Norway. We can also do this in a place where we think we have everything managed and everything is okay. We also have to do our homework right. I show you one example, Forneby. Uh, Forneby, the old airport of, of Oslo. I did work on this project uh, with Spurberg Lindheim uh, some years ago. And we tried to collect every drop of rainwater for this new site and collect it. And what we did in the park, there is first uh, a sort of uh, a retention or a detention place where we did the water management first and then the city will grow and there will be a lot of more buildings all around. So with this, I think I gave you a little bit an overview about how to integrate this water question with the city, with the city fabric and really how to bring that two things together. So thank you very much.